have another strange day in financial markets today. Shock of shocks. But we are once again trying to unpack what the next thing that comes around is going to do. And so we are going to focus on next steps, even as we parse financial markets, seemingly doing something that um, is, if nothing else, out of turn with how they've been behaving in the very recent past. Welcome. This is Macro Money. I'm Elias Pivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we're going to take a look here at how the markets have digested what is a hotter inflation number, which was, of course, the focus uh, really for markets for much of the week. And then take a look at what these dynamics suggest going forward and how that might translate as the next piece of eye-catching economic data comes across the wires, the U.S. retail sales report, uh, which will be with us in less than 24 hours. So let's, uh, first of all, anchor ourselves uh, in what it is that we're talking about uh, and ask ourselves really, where is the pain point? And if there even is one, because I think as we look at the way these markets have digested incoming economic data, what comes back is a story of resilience that made sense and now maybe is starting to be a little bit detached from even its own logic when we consider uh, how the stock market got to the heady record levels that we find it at. So let's begin with just a view of what happened with what was easily the most um, high profile data release for this week. Yesterday's uh, publication of the February US CPI report. Of course, we came into it with um, the market's odd reaction to last week's developments. We, uh, of course, had a uh, Fed uh, Chair Powell testifying last week, and then we had a jobs report. Uh, and strangely, we saw that with last week's performance, the market seemed kind of disconnected, uh, where the message from Powell seemed to be, we want to cut rates, we very much want to get to a point where we feel confident enough. Our baseline is that we're going to do it this year to some degree. In response, yields fell. Then you got the jobless uh, rate higher in the uh, employment report. You got wages weaker th than expected, not by a long mile, but nevertheless growing slower than the forecasts had them. And so, again, yields lower gold higher yen higher all of all of that seemingly telling the same story we're getting ready to cut yields are are, are coming down and yet stocks didn't like it last week nasdaq off 1.6% s&p off 0.3% and so markets went into this week going okay well the next big one is cpi obviously the fed cares the most about inflation uh, at this point. They've said as much. What's going to happen here? And for the second month running, the results come out and it's a stronger, hotter set of numbers. So you can see here, headline comes in at 3.2. Expectation was 3.1. Core comes in at 3.8. Expectation was 3.7. So across really every measure, as you dig into these numbers, you get the sense hotter inflation than expected. And then you get this response from markets. And you can kind of separate this response into the parts that make sense 
and the parts that raise questions. Yields go up. 10 years up, two years up. Of course, the inverse of that is bonds are down. That makes sense. Hotter CPI numbers mean fewer Fed rate cuts, most likely. So yields are higher. Gold is down. It yields nothing. Interest rates go up. So the return on owning uh, assets that yield greater than zero is that much more attractive. So gold falls. That makes sense. Bitcoin yields nothing. It falls. That makes sense. Yen yields nothing. It falls. That makes sense. The dollar idles. It gets a little bit of a gain against the yen, which is broadly lower, but generally doesn't really go anywhere. Euro doesn't really do anything. Uh, as you can see here, it, it turned out a big goose egg on the day when, when we look at 6E futures. Pound doesn't really go anywhere. Aussie doesn't really go anywhere. But stocks record impressive gains. And to add insult to injury, the NASDAQ, which is the more yield sensitive of the major indices, it outperforms. It's up 1.4, uh, S&P up almost 1.1. And so naturally the question becomes, well, wait a minute now. Last week, yields and stocks moved down together when the Fed was dovish or seemed like it would be more dovish. This week, we get data that seems like the Fed is going to be less dovish. Stocks and yields go up together. This is a bit different. And so, as we kind of scratch our heads here, we go back to the drawing board and say, well, what has been the relationship between markets and the Fed outlook? And does that broadly make sense and fit within some kind of a framework that we can extrapolate at least as a lens with which to look at where markets are going next? Here's what we find. In the line there, the, the blue line is, of course, the S&P 500 as a kind of benchmark for Wall Street stock market catch-all. In the gray bars, you have the Fed funds futures implied rate cut tally for 2024. This is what's baked into the markets. And so what you see, and then, of course, the, the green line is the Fed's own forecast at negative 0 0.8. That's as of December when the FOMC issued its latest dot plot forecasts for where members see the Fed funds rate going this year. And they're looking for 80 basis points and cuts. That's essentially three cuts, but they round the number down. So we'll take it, um, we'll take it in, um, We'll take it at face value. 0 0.8 is what they said. So, and of course, they're rounding up the digits. They're rounding down because it's one digit versus two. Let's be very, very uh, clear about what the Fed is doing. So, okay, the green line is the baseline as of December. Take a look at what we're seeing here then. As you start this rally in late October, early November, what you see is that it begins in almost perfect unison with the shifting out of Fed rate cut expectations from about 60 to 150 by the turn of the calendar year. And of course, the Fed is feeding this. In November, they come out and say, okay, we had a hawkish message for you in September. You've now adjusted. Good for you. The 50 basis points extra that we thought we needed in tightening, the markets have done for us now. Great. Okay. We feel like this rate hike cycle is about done. 
in December, they confirm with still more overt language saying, yeah, we think the peak in rates is there. We're going to start to look at cutting here sooner rather than later. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. As you get that messaging from the Fed and all of the interspersed commentary between meetings from Fed officials kind of reinforcing this view, the outlook on cuts starts growing. And against that backdrop, risk rises. But of course it does. Because why wouldn't it? What the Fed is expected to do is deliver cheaper money in the future. Which means that if you take a bet now and you're wrong and you lose the money, it'll be cheaper to borrow it back in the future. So it makes sense to take risk with the money because if you lose it, you can get it back cheaper than you had it. Okay, so the market starts taking risk and starts saying, okay, well, the Fed's going to cut. That's good. It's good for economic activity because it makes borrowing cheaper. It's good for the overall risk-taking environment because it makes any losses on taking risk in the markets more digestible. Let's take a bet. And so stocks go up. When you get to December, the Fed establishes this baseline of 80 basis points. The market at this point is almost at double that. And so it continues to make sense to take risk because the market then says, right, so we're right. Because we're baking in what we're baking in. If we thought we were wrong, we'd be baking in something else. So the market is saying, we're right. The Fed is going to have to ultimately acquiesce and come our way on this. And so as time goes on, the Fed baseline will move our way. And what we'll see is a situation where, again, the money is going to be cheaper in the future than the Fed is accounting for. And the spread is anywhere between 60 and 50 basis points, give or take, between where we are and where the Fed is. And so the money is the, the going to be cheaper than the Fed currently allows. Again, same logic, risk off. We can see that here, as a matter of fact, where we get to a point, the market stalls, gets to the beginning of the year and goes, nope, there's still a big cheap money spread here. Let's keep going. But the data actually turns out not as the markets ostensibly thought, but more so in line with the Fed's own projections. Because what we then find is that at the start of the year, this is the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index, that measures the uh, performance of data outcomes relative to forecasts. So if the data outperforms, the index goes up. If the data underperforms, it goes down. So from the beginning of the year up through maybe the start of February or so, we get a situation where U.S. economic data is outperforming, not underperforming. And so what we end up with is Fed rate cut expectations fading away. You can see that here. As the data outperforms, the markets go, yeah, they're not going to need to do as many cuts. And as we move along this ascent here, we see, okay, now the cheap money gap is getting smaller. It's getting smaller. It's getting smaller. It's gone. And so we find ourselves basically at the deciding line here. Now, how is it that at this point, stocks are still holding up reasonably well? Why is it that we're seeing this resilience? Well, we're at 71 basis points now. So perhaps... 
we are still leaning in the Fed's direction because the Fed said 80 basis points. It tends to move in 25 basis point increments. So really what they're saying is we're going to do 75 basis points in cuts with some optionality on a fourth cut. At 80, that's an extra five basis points out of a 25 basis point cut. So from the Fed's perspective, it's three cuts and something like a 20% chance, 30% chance, depending on sort of where you take your market snapshot of a fourth one. Now we are at 71 basis points. So if you look at where we are currently, then we have 21 of 25 basis points of that third cut baked in, which is obviously the majority of it. Something like 84% likelihood that we are looking at um, that third cut. So ostensibly, the markets are still not quite taking in that this is now tighter money than the Fed's own forecast. They're saying, okay, look, this thing oscillates. It's It comes up a little bit. It comes down a little bit. We've been basically anchored here at this 80 basis point line for the better part of a month now. So, okay. Two cuts and 80, 85 percent chance of a third is basically three cuts so nothing is spoiled here it's still good it's still good however if this comes down to let's say 61 basis points well then we are in a different world 61 basis points becomes that line in the sand at which the probability of that third cut is less than 50 percent and it's a simple math. One cut is 25 basis points. Half of that is 12 and a half. So if you want to price in a probability of less than 50% that you get that third cut, you have to go to 61 basis points. 50 basis points plus 11 rather than 12 and a half. And we're not going to quibble over half a basis point here. So we'll, we'll say anything less than 12 basis points beyond 50 that's baked in gives us a less than even chance that there is that third cut, which means the markets have really and truly moved to a tighter setting than the Fed's own forecast. And again, the Fed meets next week. We're going to get an updated forecast. So we're going to reset this conversation then. Maybe. Although Fed policy officials have routinely said, we still think the December forecast is, is good, and they've been saying it all up into this week because the, their, um, their custom is to have a blackout period the week before an FOMC announcement so as not to get the markets too hopped up on speculation. So yet we don't actually know if the CPI number has altered their thinking in any way, even anecdotally. But we do get that update. So we'll see how it goes. But for right now, the line in the sand ostensibly is 61 basis points, which is about 10 basis points higher from where we are today. And whether we get there or not becomes a function of economic data. And the next piece of economic data is retail sales. The forecast is that we are going to get an increase of 0.8%. That would be encouraging, not only because the previous month was a 0.8% decline, but because when we look at the year-on-year -year figures, January was really quite the abysmal month for retail sales. And by the way, that's not a hangover from the holidays. Uh, I thought maybe perhaps 
there is some sort of a seasonality to people tending to spend in November and December, and then in January they take a break. No, that hasn't held up for the past several years. But as it turns out, in January, retail sales increased just 0.6% year on year. That is the lowest since retail sales became positive again after this COVID slump right here. The next lowest reading in this look back period is this decline of negative uh, 5% right here. Mid-2020 or so. End of the, the second quarter of that year. Sort of the heart of COVID. So a bounce here would be good news. At least as far as the U.S. economy is concerned, because of course consumption is overwhelmingly the driver of U.S. economic growth, but of course also inflation. Now again, if we look back at this index, we can see that data has started to fade relative to forecasts, perhaps because those forecasts have been updated. And so now the risk is that we might actually underperform or have a tendency to underperform more so than the other way around. The important thing is not to conflate that with all data has to undershoot expectations because clearly just yesterday we saw CPI and it did not undershoot, it overshot. So take this with a grain of salt. But it does suggest here that the way that economists' models are tuned now, we're getting a greater tendency to come in softer relative to before. We're still above zero. So the tendency is still for U.S. data to register north of forecasts. Just the margins by which it underperforms seem to be getting hemmed in. However, here's a survey uh, of sector performance in February from S&P Global. They release a sector PMI. Again, this is in the logic of PMIs here. So 50 is neutral. You can see that right here. Anything north of it is growth. Anything uh, this way, I suppose uh, this is a weird way to say north and south because this is a chart arranged where this is up and that's down. But anything above 50 is growth. Anything below 50 is contraction. Look at the sectors that did really well in February in the dark here. It's consumer goods, which is by far the best performing. And it's consumer services, which had a very brisk recovery after a soggy January. Financial services probably have uh, the biggest swing. Great January, awful February in relative terms. So growth slowed aggressively. But... It's the consumer that really had it a moment in the sun here in February. And so perhaps what we're looking at is an upside surprise. Now, if that upside surprise is going to take us closer to 61 on this Fed rate cut tally, we might well see stock markets begin to get uncomfortable. Do we need to get to 61? We'll see. 10 basis points in a single day is a lot. But if the trajectory is toward hemming this in and we get into the 60s and stock markets start to wobble a bit, well, then we'll know we're on the right track, at least in our thinking about how this works. And that is Macro Money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and what it might mean going forward. Back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays. On with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays. Writing for the News and Insights portion of TastyLive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. See you tomorrow.